Well, good morning again. Bethany ARP as we come together for Sabbath school today. Uh, in the month of November, we'll be in the book of Deuteronomy. And today we're going to be in chapter 6 of the book of Deuteronomy. And no, uh, uh, But let's go ahead and open word prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks again for the day you've granted to us by your grace. And God, we ask that your Holy Spirit would uh, watch over us as we study your word, as we uh, think through the testimonies of your truth, that we might apply these things under our lives today. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, again, as you're turning there to uh, 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 Deuteronomy chapter 6, uh, today we'll be look, uh, in our catechism question. We're in catechism question number 19. So our catechism today, again, question 19. What is the misery of that estate wherein to man fell? Answer. All mankind by their fall lost communion with God, are under his wrath and curse, and so made liable to all miseries in this life, to death itself, and to the pains of hell forever. Now, you know, the, you know, the catechism question and answer here are continuing to kind of lay out what happened because Adam ate of the fruit of the garden. And the first thing that we see there in the answer is that all mankind, that's everybody who's ever lived, has lost communion with God. That means that we as sinners cannot approach the living and the true God. And we've also lost all the benefits of communion with God. So we no longer have his presence, at least not in a gracious sense, you know, have his presence. We no longer have the blessings of his protection. And also it means that we no longer have his righteousness. And so one of the things that has to take place in our salvation is not only are our sins forgiven, but we are made new creatures and we're given the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That communion with God is reestablished. And so now we have access to the Father, right? We have access to the protections of the Holy Spirit. And we also have the blessings of being convicted of our sin. Now, we don't often think of conviction being a blessing, but uh, Paul in Romans 7 talks about how did he know that he was a sinner? Because the law told him he was a sinner. And his conscience told him he was a sinner. And the beauty of the gospel is, is that knowing that we're a sinner means that we know to look for an answer to that sin. And we know to look in the only place where it can be found, in Jesus Christ. And so uh, part of the miseries that we have as sinners uh, before we come to faith is that we're groping in the darkness. We're looking for things to assuage the pain, uh, but we don't, again, know where to look because our hearts are dark and we're dead and all those kind of things. So that's part of the misery that the catechism is talking about here. And as the catechism continues down this path, eventually we're going to get to, to Jesus, to the, uh, to, to the answer uh, for this problem. Now, uh, let's go ahead and turn to our um, scripture lesson today, uh, which is in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Uh, like I said, we're going to be in Deuteronomy all this month. Um, you know, since we've skipped all the way to the sixth chapter, uh, you know, it's worthwhile for us again, just to remind ourselves what the book of Deuteronomy is about, why it's in our Bible and what its purpose is for the believer. You know, the book of Deuteronomy, it literally means the second giving of the law. Uh, and the second giving of the law was necessary because the people needed to be reminded what was expected of them when they went into the land of promise. You know, the, the, the giving of the book of Deuteronomy really is just one long sermon that Moses preaches to the people. And he does so, obviously, with the understanding that uh, he's not going to experience the blessings of the land. That's one of the reasons why the book of Deuteronomy ends with the death of Moses. It is kind of his last will and testament, uh, if you want to think of it that way, to the nation of Israel. And the book of Deuteronomy you, you contains in it a number of um, uh, testimonies, again, to the preparations that are going to take place for that. So the first portion of the book of Deuteronomy is all about the, 
destruction and the battles uh, with the peoples on the east side of the Jordan. It's a kind of continuation of the book of Numbers in that way. And now when we get into chapter 4, we get the meat of the sermon of Moses. And it begins with, Now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the judgments which I teach you to observe, that you may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers is giving you. So Israel, first of all, you need to listen. Second of all, what do you need to listen to? You need to listen to the statutes and the judgments which I teach you to observe. And if you observe those <coughs> statutes and judgments, you're going to go into the land, you're going to possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers is giving you. Now, again, the, the, the testimony here is pretty basic, right? It's straightforward as to what's expected as well as what Moses is doing in the book of Deuteronomy. Now, in the section that we have before us today, uh, Moses has just completed the giving of the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy chapter 5 and a, a retelling of the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. So this is kind of the, the second part of the sermon uh, here in chapter 6. And it begins much like chapter 4 did. Chapter 6 verse 1 says, Now this is the commandment, and these are the statutes and judgments the Lord your God has commanded to teach you that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess. All right, so chapter 6, as I said, kind of begins in the same way chapter 4 did. Now one of the things that's important for us to see here in the beginning of chapter 6 is whenever you have a, a, a passage in the Bible where three things are mentioned like this, commandments, statutes, and judgments. Now, the, what Moses is doing there is not sa necessarily saying that there are three kinds of laws. It is a way of speaking where he is talking about everything. You know, this is similar to what we see, for instance, in Ephesians chapter 5 or Colossians chapter 3 when we hear about psalms, uh, you know, hymns, and spiritual songs. You know, when Paul writes that, he's not saying that there are three different kinds or three different types. It is a manner of speaking to talk about the Psalms as a whole. Right? You know, within the Psalms, you have hymns and you have spiritual songs and obviously you have Psalms. But it's a totality of the 150 Psalms. That's just a, a manner of speaking which was common in a biblical times. So when Moses says... Commandments, statutes, and judgments. He's talking about the whole law of God. Okay, so this is what he is communicating to the people. And what he's telling them is, first of all, where have the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments come from? From God, right? From the Lord your God. And that's important because Moses is a mediator. Right? He is not the authority in and of himself. He is communicating to the people what God has told him. And in that way, you know, Moses is acting as a priest to the people. Right? He's showing the people, again, what God has re revealed so that they will know what to do, what the Lord your God has commanded to teach you. Now, there's something else that's important to see here in the language of verse 1. We also are told that the Lord, your God, is the one who has commanded these things. Whenever we see Lord capitalized in the Bible, we know that means the covenant relationship, right? The covenant communion between Jehovah and his people. This is meant to draw to mind uh, the people of Israel to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it's meant to bring them to mind the promises that were made to them in the covenants made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the uh, summary of the covenant that Jehovah made with Abraham is, I am the Lord your God, and you are my people. And that is the context in which we obey the law of God. And it's important for us to remember that our relationship to the law fundamentally does not change in the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. We are not saved 
in the old covenant by works and saved by grace in the new covenant. You know, our obedience to the Lord in both the old covenant and in the new covenant is based on the gracious gift of Jehovah God. And so the Lord God who has called you out of darkness, out of the land of bondage, is giving you this land of promise. And as part of this gift, you are to obey the commandments of the Lord. But your obedience is out of your love for the Lord God. It is a response to the grace that has been shown to you by Jehovah. And that's very important because one of the things that the Pharisees do is they flip that on its head. And any works-based religion does that. It, 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 it takes the good gift of God, in this case the law, and makes it the means by which we gain the love of God. So if, if, if you're a good Pharisee and you want God to love you, what do you need to do? Obey all the laws, right? Obey the commandments. Now, what's the problem with that? We can't do that. And so if you can't follow the law enough to get God to love you, what does that do to your relationship with the Lord? That's right. It pushes the Lord farther and farther away from you. Now, if you're a good Pharisee, uh, you know, when you wake up in the morning, you plan your day so that you don't violate the law. Now, is that a good thing? Yes, right? You know, we, we should plan our days so that we don't violate the law of God, right? But there's a difference between doing that so that we earn the love of God versus planning our day to not violate the law of God because of the love that God has shown to us. Right? That's a totally different way of approaching the commandments of God. Right? Because we believe the commandments of God are a blessing to us. Right? We believe that the commandment is good. Right? That the commandment is wise. That the commandment is in every way a blessing to the believer. And the reason for that is, is because what is God's purpose in giving us the commandments? Right, show us our need of him, right? To remind us again that he, his plan is wiser than our plan, right? To show us that his ways are better than our ways. To remind us that not only are you a sinner, but that you, having been saved by the blood of the Lamb, need to order your life, your life in accordance with what God has said. And again, you do that, again, out of a desire to serve the Lord God. Right? It is not a burden placed on you. Right? It's a blessing given to you. And so in Deuteronomy chapter 6, as, as Moses is laying this out for the people... Right? He tells them, God has commanded to teach you that you may observe the land which you are crossing over possess, that you may fear the Lord your God, to keep all the statutes, commandments, which I command you, you and your son and your grandson, all the days of your life, that your days may be prolonged. Now, sometimes we hear that and think that God is grading us on our obedience to him. So that, in other words, um, you know, we get in by grace, but we stay in by works, right? In other words, Jesus' work on the cross cleans the slate. And in using kind of Old Testament language, right? The, the cross gets us from, uh, from Egypt to the promised land. But as soon as you cross that Jordan River, your staying in the land is based upon your obedience to the law. Now, if our salvation was only halfway like that, right? You know, our being saved was only kind of getting us to the to back to the starting point. Uh, how far would we go before we got kicked out of the land? 
Not far, right? We might put our foot on the dry land, but more than likely, as soon as our foot got in the water on the east side of the Jordan, we'd be getting our foot pulled out of the water and we'd be going back to, to Egypt, right? It's kind of like, you know, playing Monopoly and every time you roll the dice, you end up going to jail, right? You don't collect $200, right? You just go right back to jail. And as soon as you get out of jail, you go right back to jail. Right. Now, is there any assurance in a religion like that? No. But every religion in the world, outside of Christianity, is organized in that way. And so you live in constant fear that if you died right now, what would happen to you? You'd go to hell. Um, you, know, that, you know, that is exactly how the Roman Catholic religion is set up. So if you're going to go on a trip and get on a plane, what better you do right before you get on that plane? You better go to a priest and you better get absolution and you better make sure that you have confessed every sin. Because what happens if you leave out one? <laughs> you're in trouble, right? Now, you know, that again is not to say that we have an antinomian God. Right, that we are allowed to sin as much as we want once we come to faith. Right? Because what does Paul say about that? Should you sin that grace might abound? No. You know, he uses a strong word there. You know, may it never be is how we've kind of softened this language there a little bit. But again, we have to have a right relationship, right understanding of the law in the Christian life, or we're never going to understand the gospel itself. And part of that, again, is our obedience to the law of God. Right? We have to understand you know, our, our motivation for obedience to God. Right? Because we are called to obey the law in every jot and tittle. Right? There's no part of the law that we're not called to obey. But our motivation for obedience must come out of our understanding of grace and not out of our understanding of the law. Because again, if you mix law and gospel, you end up with a workspace religion where there is no assurance, right? There is no uh, you know, peace and there's no comfort in that kind of religion. And so that's part of what Moses is doing here. And that's why when he um, comes down to verse four, he says, therefore, hear, O Israel, be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you, that you may multiply greatly as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you a land flowing with milk and honey. So this land is being given to you by grace. You have been made right with the Lord by grace. And you, in light of that grace, should obey the law. Right? That is, again, and if you don't obey the law, what's going to happen? Judgment's going to come. Right? You, you are called to obey, not you know, not in like this kind of um, you know spoiled rich kid kind of way, right? Where you you you, you get in trouble all the time, but what does Daddy do for you? <laughs> he gets you out, right? Daddy comes and bails you out of jail every time you're in trouble, pays off the judges and all that kind of stuff. So you go through the motions of judgment, but what do you not actually? What doesn't actually happen to you? Right? There's no punishment, right? It's just the appearance of things, right? You're more, you're more inconvenienced, right, than you are actually in trouble. So Moses here wants the people to understand that there are going to be real consequences if they don't obey the law, right? If they don't, uh, you know, you show forth thanksgiving to the Lord uh, for this gift of the promised land. And it's important to see here that Moses quotes his own writings. And the reason why that's important for us to notice is because it tells us something about how the Bible works. Right? Moses is self-consciously writing scripture. He knows what he's doing when he's writing the five books which bear his name. It's not as if they were adopted later on and given authority by Ezra or Nehemiah or whoever. Right? The words of Moses, he understands, are the very word of the living God. And the authority that Moses has in writing these words is not of his own. 
Right? This authority comes to him from Jehovah God. And so when he quotes from Exodus here in saying a land flowing with milk and honey, right, he has verified the authority of scripture, right? Because he's using scripture to teach, right? He's using scripture to apply what he's saying here in the book of Deuteronomy. This is similar to when Jesus quotes from the Old Testament, he is showing the authority that the prophets had, that Moses had, that all of these men had. Right? He's testifying, saying, hey, these are my very words that have been given to the prophets in the days before. You know, they are just as much scripture as the words I say. You know, and I, I know you all heard me say this before, but one of the banes of my existence are red-letter Bibles. Because what are red-letter Bibles implicitly teach? Right, that the red letters are more important than the black letters. Uh, but if Bible publishers are being honest, what parts of the Bible should be read? All of them, right? Because it's all the very word of the living God, right? It's all Jesus' words, if you want to think of it in that way. Now, so Moses here, when he's quoting from Exodus at the end of verse 3, it is teaching us, again, something about how we should receive the authority of the Bible. And when it comes to questions about what is right and what is good and how we should do things in the church, what authority do we go to? The Bible, right? Because it is God's communication to us, right? It's God's revelation to us. So again, Moses is using it just in that way. And then in verse four, he delivers what has become known the great Shema. Now, you know, that's just a fancy way of saying that God's name is being declared. And it says there, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now, <clears throat> we understand that this verse is speaking of the triune God. And it's making a statement about the Trinity. You know, think about what's being said here. Hear, O Israel. Right, listen, open your ears, pay attention. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. So Jehovah God is one God. He's not multiple gods. He's not many gods. He's not, you know, separated God, right? You know, God the Father is not super divine. And then Jesus is kind of semi-divine. And the Holy Spirit is, a, is even a, you know, sub-divine being under the Father and the Son. Right? We testify and believe that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are equal in power and glory. Right? That they are united together as one eternal being. Now, whenever you get into Trinitarian stuff, it's very easy to start getting into not just things that are above my head, but it's easy to start getting into heresy. Right? Uh, and that's one of the reasons why it's helpful for us to somewhat speak of it in a negative way. Right? We believe that Jesus is God, but that God is not Jesus. Now, what that means is, is that Jesus is the second person of the Holy Trinity and is God. But God is not fully Jesus, right? Because Jesus is a person within the Trinity, right? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And so God is three in one and one in three. And the Shema here is testifying to that. And what's important about that for us is a reminder that our faith is based upon a Trinitarian revelation of the Lord God. And so our faith is based upon the fact that God the Father has sent God the Son to die for our sins on the cross, that the Holy Spirit applies the resurrection gift of Jesus to all of the Lord's people. And that that triune gift is the foundation, the basis for our obedience to the Lord. So when we think about our obedience in the law, 
You know, first of all, we are to look up unto heaven and we are to be reminded of Abba Father. All right. Now, um, you know, this might, you know, uh, step on some toes, but I'm sure you've probably heard, heard people say that Abba means daddy, right? You know, that, um, you, know, you know, that, you know, kind of, uh, I'm trying to think the right way to say this, that uh, kind of um, childlike uh, talk of God. But that's not what Abba means. Um, you know, Abba is a testimony to the greatness, to the fullness of the deity, okay? So Abba Father, that testimony that we see there in the book of Romans is a reminder of exactly what we see here in the Shema, that when we think of our relationship with God, right, we immediately are to think of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we need to be careful that we don't give more power or more authority to any person of the Godhead. Right? We do this sometimes when we only talk about Jesus. Uh, you know, you, 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 the Father and the Holy Spirit sometimes get forgotten about a little bit. Right? Because of you know, the, the nature of just kind of how our brains work. Right? Because when we think of our salvation, who saved us? Right? God did, right? The triune God saved us, but sometimes we limit it to just what happens at the cross, right? Jesus is the one who physically bore our sins upon himself, and he was the one who was raised from the dead for our justification, and so Jesus kind of gets more time uh, for our thanks and for our prayer and things like that. That's one of the reasons why when Jesus teaches us to pray, he teaches us to start with the Father. Because our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Right? Our salvation is because God the Father has sent God the Son to lay down his life for our sins. And so we need to remember again that each part of the Trinity is just as important as the other parts of the Trinity. And that's one of the reasons why, again, this Shema testifies that the Lord our God, the Lord, is one. Right? That the Lord God is united in his work for Israel, right? for the church and for the people of God. And so then we hear in verse 5 um, a testimony that we hear from the Lord Jesus. Remember when Jesus is summarizing the commandments, you know, what is the summary of the first four commandments? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. You see, when Jesus quotes the Bible, he wants us not just to focus on that one little verse. He wants us to go back and look at the context around that quote. And so the, the context of the summary of the first table of the law is the great Shema, right? It is this promise that has been laid down upon us by our triune God. So hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be where? In thy heart, right? In your heart. Because something that he's going to talk about later on in the book of Deuteronomy is... What has to be changed for you to understand the power of the forgiveness of sins? The heart, right? The heart has to be circumcised. Right? It has to be marked. Right? It has to be made the Lord's. And so the heart of the gospel right, for us is that the Lord, your, you are to love the Lord your God with your heart, with your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. Right? And the language of that means that it should envelop us in our entire being. Right? You know, going back to Colossians three and Ephesians five, you know, the the purpose of the Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs is that we are allowing the Word of Christ to dwell within us. Richly, right? That's part of the uh, the when um, when Ezekiel is preaching and prophesying. One of the things that he's told to do is to eat 
the book, all right? Um, now, you know, if you eat your Bible today, are, are you going to know it better? I don't know, maybe. I mean, you might be reading it while you're trying to stuff it down your throat, but, you know, that's not really what is meant there, right? Uh, Ezekiel eating the book is an image, a symbol of what we are to do with the Word of God, right? We are to get it inside of us, right? It's supposed to be who we are, right? This goes back to something Jesus is going to say in the Gospel of Mark about the nature of our obedience. Right? It's not what it's not what goes into a man that defiles him, but what what comes out. Right? Now, you know, the seed of the soul is the heart, right? And the heart testifies to who we really are. Uh, we can try and hide who we really are. But our heart will always, um, you know, you know, be shown, um, you know, either to God or to the world. And so, if we are to be obedient to the Lord, if we are to obey the commandments of the Lord, then our hearts need to be with Jesus, right? They need to be with the Word of the Living God. And so, here in the command that comes after this. Verse seven through nine, you know, the, you know, while there is a literal component to this, uh, you know, there is something much more going on here than you know meets the immediate eye. So in verses seven through nine, it says, "You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign in your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes." You shall write them on the doorpost to your house and your gates. Now, um, I've shared with you before that, you know, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania has the second largest Hasidic Jewish uh, community in the United States. And Hasidic Jews are ultra-Orthodox. Sometimes you're called that. Well, one of the things you'll see as you walk around Squirrel Hill in Pittsburgh is that the men will have, literally, have a droplet right here in the front of their forehead. Now, what is that? Right. And you know what's contained in there? Right. A little piece of scripture. Because what are they keeping in front of their eyes as they walk around? Man, well, isn't that what verse 8 tells us to do? All right. Put a frontlet between your eyes. Another thing you'll notice as you drive around is that on the door frames of their houses, guess what's written? The Shema. Deuteronomy 6.4 is written in Hebrew on the door frames of their houses. Now, is that necessarily a bad thing? No, right? If you want to draw the Shema on your front of your house, go right ahead. You know, knock yourself out. But is, is that really what Moses is talking about here? No. What he's saying is, is that when you teach your children the commandments of the Lord, what has to be part of the teaching of the commandments? Right, that the Lord your God is one. Right, the Lord your God called us out of bondage in Egypt and has given to us this land, which is not ours, but is a gift of the Lord. And you know, so we see here that Moses is telling them, you need to teach them the gospel. Right? You need to remind them who God is and you need to teach them about obedience that is grounded in this heart which has been circumcised, right? Which has been marked out for service unto the Lord. So when you teach them diligently to your children, right? You talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. Yes, you should talk to your children about the Bible, right? And you should talk to them about the work of the Lord. But the real message here is that, you know, in, in many ways, people ought to be able to read scripture by the way you act in public, right? Your children ought to be able to see your relationship with the Lord God as you walk upon the way, as you rise up from your bed, and as you go to bed at night, right? It should be a witness, you know, the, 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 you know just your whole manner of life, right? That's really what's being said here. And so in verse 9, when it says, writing them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates, well, what should your house be known for? Obedience to the Lord, right? When you go inside your house, you should be just as obedient to the Lord as you are when you're outside your house, 
Um, you know, because you know, the, the warning that's kind of contained in here is if you are godly and witness the good things of the Lord outside your house, but you go inside your house and it's like a pagan temple, what good is that? No, I mean, it's, it, it, it serves no purpose, right? You know, that's exactly the kind of thing Jesus is talking about when he describes the Pharisees as whitewashed tombs. Right? Because what does the outside look like? Nice and clean and everything, but what's inside? Darkness, Darkness and dead men's bones, right? Now, you, we can even kind of take this a little bit further and talk about our individual relationships with the Lord, right? You, you can walk around with droplets in front of your eyes and with your little tassels and, and with your beards real long and your black hats and everything, but if your heart is far from the Lord... You know, what good is all the outward trappings of religion? Right? It serves no purpose. In fact, it's actually a judgment. You know, it's going to be worse for you in the day of judgment than it is for somebody who's openly pagan. Uh, because somebody who's openly pagan is honest about who they are. Right? They're not trying to uh, get both ways, you know, in, in a sense. And so this should be a, you know, a part of the just kind of the daily life of the people of God. You know, so we see later on here in, in chapter 6, it says, So it shall be when the Lord your God brings you into the land which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Again, pointing them back to the promises, to the covenant promises of God. Because that's another thing that's important for us to see here, is that God relates to his people by covenant, right? by the promise that he has for us. And so our faith, our salvation is bound up in the promise that God the Father made to God the Son. You know, that if God the Son laid down his life for his people, for the church, then the church would be raised from the dead and would be given new life in him. And so you know, the colloquial way we talk about that and the way our catechisms and our, um, you know, our confession talks about it is the covenant of grace. You know, the covenant of grace is made, and again, there's different thoughts on this, but this is my personal opinion. So take this one forth. But, uh, you know, that the covenant of grace is made between God the Father and God the Son. And it's made, it, you know, to us in Christ. Okay, so we, we come with Christ as part of the, the agreement, as part of the package, if you will. All right? And we see that in the, in the high priestly prayer in John 17. Right? And, you know, Jesus talks there about those who are his. And those that belong to him, um, and, and those that, that will be with him. Well, here in Deuteronomy 6, right, we see Moses pointing them back to the covenant promise made with Abraham. The covenant promise is, is that God is your God and you will be his people. Right? And that's part of the part of the beauty, part of the joy that we get out of the covenant of grace. When we, especially when we're struggling with sin, you know, where are we to look? Right, to the cross, right? We're to look at the promises that God has made. You know, that's, that's part of what John does there at the beginning of 1 John as he's reminding us about the advocate that we have with the Father. Right? Jesus Christ, the righteous, right? He is the great high priest, right? He's the mediator. And so if we are struggling in sin, we go to the mediator, we go to the great high priest, and our sins are forgiven. And the reason why our sins are forgiven is because we're in Christ Jesus. And, that, and the, uh, God, the book of 1 John is, is a perfect example of what it means, again, to live in light of the gospel promise. If you hate your brother, what does that say about your relationship with Christ? Not good, right? In fact, John says you don't have a relationship with Christ if you hate your brother. Because if you're in Christ, what are you not going to do? You're not going to hate, right? And the reason for that is is because God is love. Right? And because God is love, what has he done? Right? We love God. Why? Because God first loved us. And so that, that relationship is so important 
Again, an understanding what the Lord is doing. And we see the exact same thing happening here in Deuteronomy chapter 6. So, you know, as he continues to caution them against disobedience here in the last part, and we'll close on this, he says then, you know, you know, get, you know, he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you large, beautiful cities, which you did not build. All right? That is the key passage. All right? if, if you want to underline anything in your Bible, underline that. Because what role did you have in your salvation? None. None. Right? The only thing you did is contribute the sin which made it necessary. Right? Um, you know, that's like going to the bank and saying, hey, you know, I have all this debt here. Can I use that to pay for something? <laughs> What's the bank going to say? <laughs> that's not how that works, right? Now, that's our, how our government works, right? But that's not how God works, right? That, and that's not how this works. And so all of the warnings that come after this are grounded in this reality. Remind, remember who you are in the Lord God. Remember how you got here. And as long as you do that, the Lord's going to bless you. But the second you start giving credit to yourself or to the gods of the nations, guess what's going to happen? God's going to take it away, right? God's going to remove you from this place. And we'll go ahead and close on that. But you know, we'll, we'll hear a lot more about this as we go through the book of Deuteronomy. But any questions or comments or anything? Right. Well, if not, let us go ahead and close in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks again for the good day you've granted to us by your grace. We ask, dear God, that you would help us again uh, to remember our relationship to you, uh, that we have gotten into your kingdom by your grace, that we stay in your kingdom by grace, that we go to heaven by grace. And these things motivate us to love you, and to love you first among all things. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen.